Files. So I'm here with Linda Brooks. She's the filmmaker behind uh, a, an amazing and affecting documentary, Mother's Day, The Forgotten Victim, Victims of Death Row. Um, congratulations and welcome Thank to you very London. much. Lovely Thank you very you. much. Um, as I said, it is affecting. Um, I've seen it. And what was really interesting, and I know you're going to give us the synopsis. Well, perhaps, yeah, if you could give us the synopsis and we could perhaps go from there. Sure. This film features the stories of five mothers whose children were sentenced to death row. And it features them to just tell their own stories in their own words yeah. of how it's impacted them. The shame, the guilt, the shunning that they felt, the fact that they are not allowed to grieve by society. The, the trauma that has come to them, I just decided that they needed a voice as well. This is not to distract or detract from the pain of the victims uh, of the crimes that these, the, the children of these women were accused of committing, but it's just to say that there are collateral consequences to the death penalty, and these women are part of those collateral consequences. Well, they're kind of living a, a, a sentence themselves. Is, uh, that's the way I would put it, because they're, dra Absolutely. they're dragged into it. And could you, for those who haven't seen this, seen this, give us an idea of the kind of vilification that some of these women receive as a result of their children's Certainly, they've received death threats. They are shunned when they just go into the grocery store. Uh, one of the mothers talks about how the fact that she and her family just had to leave their town. Yeah. They, could, they couldn't be there. They yeah. were getting death threats. They would find uh, footsteps outside their windows, glass broken, that sort of thing. Um, vandalism to their vehicles, that sort of thing. They just finally, they said, she said, we're broken. We just had to leave. And this, um, I should point out, because I, I didn't look at it, you know, I looked at your bio, and you actually started filmmaking nearly 40 years ago, and then left, you then got a, jo got a real job, it sounds, but you did, well, no, because you became a lawyer, I think, didn't you, yes, and studied yes, law, yes. Um, but I, I, I guess the passion for filmmaking never left you. That's true. I'm kind of putting words into your mouth, and I, I suspect, I'm, well, I'm fairly sure from what the conversation we've had, that the subject matter from this film in particular is as a result of what you you know about, and of course, you then went back to filmmaking. Is that is that kind well, of how it worked? Well, I've always believed in film as a powerful medium for changing people's minds about things and for social change. And um, the films that I made early in my in my life, while I was actually in college, when I was doing Tri-X and celluloid film with moviolas and things like that, I was talking about social issues then. I made a movie about the Black Panther Party in Houston. Did you? Oh, um, okay. But um, <coughs> when I went to law school, I was going to then be a lawyer, and I thought a criminal defense lawyer, but I changed my mind about that. But I have handled a num number of death penalty cases yeah. on a pro bono basis yeah. throughout my career. But at one point, I had to read numerous transcripts of capital murder trials in Texas uh, for a period of, uh, the, the trials had spanned over a period of two or three years. It was a horrific experience. Well, yeah, I mean, I don't, I, I know we, we shouldn't go into it, but of course this is your life and your history. Right, and right, right, point, right. But I can't imagine how tough the evidence you see and, and you know about and the stories that you hear, it must be awful. Well, and, and it was awful, but what really struck me was the testimony of the mothers when they did testify, when they were begging for the lives of their children and saying, please don't kill him. It's, he didn't have a chance or she didn't have a chance. It's my fault or that sort of thing. Um, so that, that testimony really touched me and made me think these are people who we don't consider as victims of the death penalty. Um, they need a voice, and I just decided to give it to them after all these years. So. And, and in terms of finding um, the mothers to talk to, I'd be interested to know what their reaction was when you said, look, because you're a very warm person to talk to. You've got, you know, I can tell you've got a nice spirit about you. And so I would imagine when you talk to these people, that must have helped because they want they want to be speaking to people that they can you know kind of communicate with and yet I wonder how many of them said no there were a few who, who just didn't respond I yeah. did a tremendous amount of research trying to find the mothers uh, these five mothers I chose because they I thought were 
all very articulate in their own way. Oh, they come across very well. Yeah. And I thought that they all, they also sort of reflected the approximate demographics mm. that children did of the death row population in the United States. As you know, there's uh, two African American women, two white, one Hispanic, and their their children are four men and one woman. Mm. So that's sort of gave me a diversity there to, to reflect what's actually on death row. They all were very eager to tell their stories. Uh, they were happy that there was somebody who wanted to hear and let them that, tell yeah, this. Yeah. And when you were, because of course you knew all the testimony of these, you knew the back, back history to these cases. Yes. But even so, when you were sitting down talking to these people, these mothers, um, they're reliving a lot of the story, and they're reliving it all, of course, and you're listening to it all because it needs to be captured on film. So must, I guess I'm, the question is, I'm trying, you know, I wondered how difficult it was to go through that process, not just for them, but for you as well. Oh, it was very difficult. I've, I've spent a lot of time crying with them, uh, we, and, and touching them, and letting them know that I really understood. They yeah. all were convinced that I cared about them and about their children. Yeah, yeah of course. I, for each one of them, I checked, to the extent that I could, I checked with their lawyers first because my number one thing right. was not to do anything to impact or prejudice, the, uh, yeah. prejudice any appeals. Right, okay. so does that mean once you'd shot the footage and locked the footage, they then needed to see the film. Well, how did that actually work? No, what I did was before I ever contacted the women, I talked to the attorneys right. to explain what I was going to do and that I would not do anything that would impact any continuing appeals. Two of the, of the men, of course, two of the mother's children have already been executed, yeah. but the three who remain on death row, I wanted to be sure that I was sensitive to any, any appeal issues there might be. Was there any, because um, we all have these moments of darkness when you wake up and there's something not quite right and you, you fret about things, it's just human nature, but was there any moment when you're making this film that you thought, I'm not sure I, now, after going through this, that I really want to complete this and actually get it out there? Never. No hesitation? Never. No. This was a mission. Interesting. Because I... I don't want to say you had the advantage of knowing about some, your professional background. Well, maybe that was an advantage because perhaps you knew how to deal with this kind of horrific crimes that are being committed and, and the reaction of the direct family members. But um, that's quite interesting because I, I, I wondered if there were times that you just thought, I don't know about this, I'm not sure. No, no. And as far as, yes, they were all horrific crimes. Yeah. Um, the two who have already been executed, the two men who have already been executed, I'm virtually positive both of them were innocent. Um, the, certainly there were crimes committed. I think those two were by someone else. I don't know about the other three. I know that um, two of them do not deny that they were involved in the crime, but they're extenuating circumstances that would suggest that perhaps death row should not have been the answer. Um, for instance, Erica, the young woman who was sentenced to death, was um, an accomplice to someone. She had her infant child with her, and the man who perpetrated the crime said that he would kill her and her baby if she didn't help him. To go through it, yeah. S yes. It's, um, and I know we are, we're going to avoid, uh, avoid this, but this is the problem that I personally have with the death penalty, is if you get the wrong person. You know, because I've long been I thought, well, you know, in certain instances, yes, but then that's the for me is the blocker, and it, we all know it's happened because you can't bring them back, can you? Right, right. You know, and if certainly it's happened, and that's not what the movie's no, supposed no, to be about. No, no, it's no. really just about letting these mothers tell their stories, but it does have the impact. Several people have told me who have seen the film of thinking. You know, it's just too final. I'm no longer in favor of the death penalty. I was before, I no longer am, because this just shows me how final it is. We can't correct our mistakes afterward. And that's, that's, that in and of itself is a reason not to have the death penalty. And, and when you show this film to, to the five mothers, did you show it to them as a group or individually? No, they've each seen it either, two of them have been able to attend screenings. Right. The others have seen it online and they all, they want to be a community 
uh, they want to reach out to each other and be able to share their feelings and their experiences. And what was, uh, what was their reaction to the film that you made? Well, it, they all No, in really, post. I mean, once yeah, they saw it, they, they really liked it. They, they appreciated it. One of the mothers said, you gave me a voice. Oh, that's lovely. I feel like now I can talk about this. I was really having a hard time talking about it. I couldn't share it with anybody. And once you talked to me, uh, she actually was at a screening in Philadelphia, in Bryn Mawr, actually. And she stood up after the screening and said, I just thank Linda Brooks for making me be able to stand up and talk about this. Thank you. And, and in terms of the planning of the film, so the re the re you're researching, because I know, obviously, as you know, I've spoken to lots of filmmakers, what most people that aren't, a, aren't involved in filmmaking might realise, particularly with documentaries, the research that's required, it could be any documentary film, if you're going to make a good documentary film, it's all about the research. Right? Absolutely. Can you give us a flavour how long this took to, you've got the idea, you really want to tell the story, now you're going to start putting it together. So from the moment you had the idea to before you shoot the film, how long did that whole process take? Oh, the idea came many, many, many years ago yeah. and I just talked with people about it and kept saying, I'm going to do this someday and then thought, I need to just do this or else I'm just a bag of wind. You know, yeah, I need yeah. to actually do this. So I very, very seriously and uh, consciously researched for about two years, reading about every mother I could, of uh, all of their stories. Uh, I read social science books about the impact of the death penalty on, on family members. Yeah. Um, I, I spoke to lots of lawyers handling death penalty cases, um, just about the kinds of issues that they were seeing with mothers who they got to testify because the mother almost always has to testify. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it took me at least two years before I had the first interview of really serious research. And the story and the planning and everything that you wanted and hoped to be in the finished film, do you think you've kind of got that or do you wish you had added more or taken more out on? So your final cut, the final final cut, because often filmmakers are always swirling around in the head. Are you 100%, 95%? Where, where would you sit on the Oh, I'd bit? say I'm probably 95%. I still think about a couple of things, but I actually have two versions of it. I had a, a feature length uh, version that has, of course, quite a lot more of the mothers, but also a lot more of my preaching. I took out my... <laughs> Right, okay. okay. So your talking head comes out. Yeah, right? yeah. And I, it wasn't me, my head. It was just but, some yeah, narration yeah. of me telling people what I thought they ought to think about the movie. Uh, I took that out so that people can just draw their own conclusions. But um, this short version, I feel like, really has an impact. I think it really does give you a sense of the pain that the mothers are feeling. I think it gives you a... a, a, a a sense of what each one of them is about. So I feel fairly satisfied with it. Um, I'll never be 100% satisfied. But. Oh, I, I've spoken to directors that, exactly, not say most, I don't, put, I don't want to assume that, but a lot of them who ask the question will say, no, I'd still like to tinker with it, but so you're not alone. And so just finally, what's next after this? Are you working on something now? Yes, I am. I'm working on a, in the research and in, very early interview stage of a movie about the survivors of sex trafficking, young women. So no, yeah. another documentary? Uh, yes, another right, documentary. Okay. And again, how did this, the idea for this film come about? For the, yeah, the, new, for film. the new, yeah. new film. I read a book called Girls Like Us. I went out researching for, for Mother's Day. You know, on Amazon, they'll always say, you might also like this book. At the bottom and it there, pulled yeah, yeah. up a book by Rachel Lloyd called Girls <laughs> Like Us. Rachel Lloyd is this amazing woman who runs Girls Education Mentoring Services in New York City. It's called GEMS. She herself is a, a, a survivor. survivor of yeah. sex trafficking, and she runs this social service agency. She's an amazing woman. Her book is beautifully written, and I just really became very uh, interested in her topic. I've become a volunteer in Houston with a similar group and am 
participating. I've trained to go out on interventions. Um, and so I'm, I'm working on this. I'm going to a training next week to learn about how to interview these women, how to speak with them, how to, to, to minister to them. So that's where I am now, really research. Well, look, the best of that, the film thank is amazing. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for joining us, and sincerely, it's an amazing piece of work. Well, thank you for the opportunity to talk about it. Thank I appreciate you. it.